Welcome to Biz Help For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. But there always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here's your host, Candy Messer. Hello and welcome to Biz Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the information on last week's show, the five stages of growth for the early stage business informative. If you are unable to join us and would like to listen to the show, links can be found on our YouTube and Facebook pages, as well as links for favorite podcast platforms. If you'd like to receive notifications on when the podcasts have been uploaded, please like and subscribe. If there are topics you'd find beneficial or questions you have, please feel free to reach out to me at media at abandp.com. Now let's learn a little bit about our guest today. Marta Growinski is a technology executive with more than 25 years of leadership experience. Martin has served as CTO and specializes in developing and implementing strategic processes, deploying new products to streamline services, and improving growth in lead generation and sales in the fields of recruiting, finance, technology, marketing, and mortgage lending. Martin is currently CEO and co-founder of Boardsy and author of The Corporate Matchmaker, Creating a Robust Boardroom. So Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure meeting you and super excited to be here. I'm glad to have you here as well. Um, Before I get into the questions that I have for you on the topic, I always ask my guests to tell us a little bit more about themselves, their background, and how they got into doing what they're doing. Yeah, so uh, my background cover a lot of this in the book. Actually, that's kind of the beginning of the book, and a lot of my motivation for writing the book comes from my upbringing. Uh, But I was raised in Poland uh, back when it was communist, Um, left when it was still communist and came to U.S. to enjoy the the freedom, the Mm -hmm. choices and the biggest part, which is the opportunities that come from the choices we make. Um, So I found myself always uh, being an entrepreneur, Um, even when I was working for companies, um, I was always given an opportunity to, whether it was running my own division or, but pretty much given hands off approach. And um, I always excelled at it. Um, from there, I moved on to doing a lot of consulting and, and then back into owning my own business. But I really enjoyed the consulting side of it. Uh, it was really fun jumping into a new business, utilizing my creativity and uh, making improvements. So. I started looking for more of a solid opportunity instead of a consulting job, something to be on a board, whether it was with a startup or mid-range company that just really wanted to elevate to a next level and had a hard time finding those opportunities. So we decided, uh, me and my old partners decided to get back together and, uh, and create that platform that would have those opportunities. So now what's great for me personally, where I get a lot of joy is I don't, Personally, you know, there's only so many companies that can personally help and right. seeing these companies get help from the top level executives that are just, you know, uh, make me look tiny. I think, you know, I, I'm always going to be humble and always try to stay humble. So I just look at some of these executives and I'm like, I mean, these guys have done and lifted some really, really, you know, made huge changes. And now these guys, I'm connecting them, or not me personally, but our company is able to connect them with these opportunities for anything from a startup to mid-range to well-funded company all the way through public companies. But we're able to connect them with these uh, opportunities and they can make a huge difference. And that all starts kind of with us. And, and it's awesome to be part of that. So it's great. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, But I do obviously want to start talking about the topic and having a board if you are a business. A lot of people would think, you know, that maybe is just for like a nonprofit or organization. But let's actually talk about what a board really is for those who may not actually understand the concept. Maybe they've never been part of an organization that had a board. So explain even just the basic definition of what that is. Absolutely. Board uh, can be looked at many different ways. Obviously, in the public sector, uh, every company has a board. Um, 
you know, there's independent boards on top of that. And I mean, it, the layers go pretty deep. And most employees, you're absolutely right. Most employees don't really have an idea. They come in, they do their work, they go home, they get paid. But they're not really, unless you're on the, you know, C-suite level, you, you're not part of the board meetings. You don't really know what drives or controls a CEO uh, when it comes to decision making. So a board is really that. Uh, and especially at a public company, you know, they can vote and, you know, uh, even if a CEO is on the board, they can be voted out. Uh, mm -hmm. They can bring on, they have the power to bring on new uh, CEOs or making big, big changes for companies. Um, and they basically ensure that that company is profitable uh, to, uh, to all the uh, people that are investing in the stocks. But yeah. on a mid-range mid level uh, and startups, we all have boards. We just don't really look at it that way. Like, you know, uh, when you start up and you have your partners, that's pretty much your board of directors or, you know, th those are the people that are on the board naturally are the people that are vested in the company, invested in the company, whether it's sweat equity or money. When you bring on investors, they get a seat on the board. Um, the one that's really fun to create for companies is really board of advisors. So mm -hmm. they don't have any legal, uh, as far as uh, uh, having any legal duties, uh, but they can really make a big change for a company, for a CEO. Imagine, you know, really needing something if you're uh, in a distribution business and you are really about to uh, you've in, already engaged some marketing, so you're ready, you're preparing to really grow to the next level, but you have one fear factor, and that is logistics. Like, how mm -hmm. am I going to deliver? What if, 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 if all of our projections are going to hit and we're going to have a 500% growth, how are we going to deliver this product? Right. And bring somebody on from logistics side that's been there, done that. Maybe it's a CEO from a logistics maybe somebody that has experienced exactly what this company is about to do, but not bringing them on full time, but bringing them on the level as an advisor. And maybe you're paying them cash and maybe you're paying them in equity as well, which gives obviously the advisor a lot of motivation to put things in place correctly. That is the power of building a board. It's just mm -hmm. really bringing in the experience, the expertise and the value and it's at a whole new level. Pop might be somebody you never even thought you can ever imagine working at your company. And they're going to be there side by side working with you. So right. I, I think that's the, that's the best. Well, I think, too, most of my you know, people that are listening to the show are probably sole owners. Maybe they might have a partner. So there's not like a whole lot of people that would automatically be on a board, like you mentioned, like investors or, or partners or yeah. things like that, too. But I think like you're saying, having a board of advisors, if you're looking at it as when you're doing everything yourself, you're not an expert in every area. So it's important no. to have those people that you can reach out to and, you know, have them give feedback and, you know, help you do some planning or things like that too. But a lot of people don't even think about having advisors in that like specific defined role. So obviously what you're just saying is if there's something that you don't know how to do, having that advisor is important. But would you say then if they don't necessarily have an actual like spelled out board, just still having someone that they can go to as like a mentor is still good? Or what would you tell someone who's like, I don't even know where to begin, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I would still look at building out a board of advisors as a sole owner. You can, like you said, you can only do so much, right? right. You're going to end up hiring employees for the daily tasks and, you know, depending on where your growth projections are or what your actual growth is. But if you are looking at stepping outside of that, I just want to run a small business and mm -hmm. do my work every day. And, you know, but if you're like, okay, I'm ready for the next level. And mm -hmm. what are the steps? Like there's a lot of people out there that they might have a great product. They might have a great service and they mm -hmm. just don't know how to execute and how to go to that next level of growth. So why not start with a board of advisors? You bring on maybe whether it's two or three or four advisors, you bring them on. Uh, it might be somebody that's been there, done that with growth mm -hmm. strategies, go to market strategies. And then you might bring on a marketing person. And then you, you know, in these days, marketing, you really got to be on top of your game. I mean, that yeah. has changed so much. I don't even want to age myself, but mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, I'm 
I'm clueless when it comes to social media marketing, in all honesty. You know, I mean, I'm trying to do my best on LinkedIn for myself, but I mean, we have a person that does that and she's younger right. and she's, you know, she knows exactly what she's doing. So um, it's uh, bringing on advisors that have those niche things. And you can have one that's like overall has that growth. Maybe he's taken a, a company or maybe two companies all the way from, you know, a, a small startup all the way through going public. That, that's mm -hmm. a great experience to have. What are those stages? So I think building that board of advisors and starting them as advisors, maybe with you know small percentage of equity that you vest over time. And then when you are ready to, when you are starting to have that growth and you're like, okay, we're growing. Like we're, you know, we just went from five employees to 50 employees, what's next? <laughs> uh, maybe at that point you go to your advisors, the ones that you have a great sync up with and you just have great energy and maybe you then elevate them and make them part of uh, of your ownership, part of you know being on the board of directors. That might be the next step. It always gives you a fishing fund at least. Mm -hmm. So if someone is hearing this and saying like, great, like I know I need to have some assistance. I can't do it all on my own, but they're not sure how to find people who are ideal in those positions. You know, do they reach out to like friends of business acquaintances? Do they look online and find like who's really good at what they do? Like how would they even start the process? Yeah, so of course you can do that. And LinkedIn is a great resource for that. Um, and friends sometimes could be a good resource. Doesn't <laughs> always mean that, you know, uh, it, it, it brings, brings forth the fruit, you can say, right? Um, and you don't want to spoil your friendship either. So right. it, that's how I always do that as a toss up. Mm -hmm. um the only problem with you know jumping in on linkedin is how much time is it going to take do i have the time since i'm already doing everything in my business do i have the right. time devoted to looking because just finding somebody that says yes i'm ready to be on a board or i'm looking for a board that's going to take time and now you got to interview the person to make sure right. they are the right person so uh coming to us we simplify that process because we've mm -hmm. already been doing that for many years. We have our network of executives that have expressed the fact that they want to be on the board and they want to help businesses. Um, and with one phone call, uh, we call it an onboarding call. We basically figure out and learn exactly where, what stages your company's at. Um, we also trigger from the interview process and onboarding process a few ideas, which really mm -hmm. gets the owner to start thinking about it. And a lot of times after we even are off the call, they might email something back totally different saying, you know, I give it some thought and here's exactly what I think I need. So really that half an hour conversation is like amazing to them because they get to bounce some feedback. Um, and, you know, we have an NDA sign, so they have the freedom to talk about whatever they need to. It's not like we're blasting their information out there. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and after that, Basically, we, we go to work and we try to find uh, the people that we think are a great fit. And that leaves them with one simple task, which is just basically interview and get to know the people and find the ones that they want to work with. Right. Well, that was going to be my next question. So whether they're trying to find someone on their own or, you know, they go to like your organization where you're trying to find, you know, someone that's a good fit. How does the entrepreneur even identify who would be a good fit for their board? So a lot of times, right, there, there's obviously, uh, and, and by the way, I know we're not asking you questions in the book, but I, I cover all this in the book, which was the reason <laughs> for writing it. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, you, you do have to look at people's experience uh, versus expertise. Um, and then you, of course, you can get into certification if they have any continued education, what are they doing to keep improving themselves? Uh, so, I mean, those are your baseline things that you're going to be looking for. Um, but you really are, once you're interviewing, whether it's first, second, or third interview, uh, and that, of course, every company is different. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, one of the other things that's really important is getting to know the executive's personal mission, vision, and their values and what they stand for. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the top executives, I mean, I just had a chat with, uh, I, I don't want to name her, but uh, a really well-known executive and that was first thing, you know, she said, because we actually have a position that is a pretty good fit for her, but I wasn't hundred percent sure. So I reached out on a personally on a personal level to her and said, Hey, got this company. Don't know if you're 
uh, ready to join another board. She's now she's a former CEO of, of a company. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But uh, and she said, yeah, absolutely. And what really struck me and made me super happy and made me smile was she said, as long as they match my values. Mm-hmm. And that is so important. And for a great board member to be on a to be a successful board member, that's exactly it. And the ones that get that, I just, I just love it. That's like half the half the you know, because everybody's like, oh, I just want the money. I just want equity. Right. I just want them to go public. No, it's it's deeper than that. And I always say that, you know, it's deeper than diversity. There's there's just so many factors that have to match up. And I think the baseline of it is uh, mission, vision and values. And if the company matches up with the executive, then you're off to a great start. Right. Well, and that's one thing I was thinking too. Obviously, you have to have some of the same core principles or things like that too. But even if you have that, I think sometimes the culture can be a little bit different too. So matching up, you know, are they going to be a good fit overall with everything too, I would assume would be important. Even if they're not working like in the business per se with all the employees around there, they're still making decisions that are going to affect everybody. No, that, that is true. I mean, culture really starts with, I think, starts with the board, which is having diversity on a board, I think is important because then it bleeds all the way through to that company. Um, you know, some people look at a board as the, the top of the triangle. I like to look at it as the bottom of the triangle, the foundation of a company, because that is what it is. It's, you know, it goes all the way through whatever happens in the board meetings bleeds all the way through what happens in the company. And if you don't, if you're not off to a good start in a weak foundation, then you know, then the rest of it falls apart. Right. So anyone who's been on a board of like a nonprofit organization or, you know, their kids had sports and they were you know, <laughs> participating on the board there, you know, most of those organizations have a monthly meeting. Do yep. you recommend having the same, you know, frequency for a business or is it less often? Is it every quarter? Like how much should they actually be meeting in terms of running the business? So that, that really is a business decision. Um, I'm on a couple of different boards and I can tell you, I have one board that I'm on and I meet with them quarterly. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm an advisor on another board, a board of advisors member. And with them, uh, we meet on a monthly basis. And outside of those monthly meetings, I might get an email once, sometimes twice a week. And he might want to get on a one-on-one call with me just to, you know, whether it's working through some problems or asking me for some advice, it might be a quick call, might be an hour call. So it really varies. So what I always say is when you're building, you have a lot more flexibility in a board of advisors. And obviously Mm -hmm. when you're down to the point, okay, I'm going to bring on this person, you're going to obviously do a discovery call and say, okay, this is how much time I think I will need in the first year. This is, you know, is this okay? Is the commitment there? Yes, the commitments are great. And you put all of that in a contract. You know, you, you have a contract. You have the whole vesting described how the, how the equity is going to be vested over three, five years, whatever it may be. Um, and no surprises. You know, here are mm-hmm. the expectations that we're looking for from you. We're going to meet once a week. It'll be, you know, for the first, say, you know, six months, we're going to meet once a week. And then after six months, it's going to be a monthly reading, meeting meeting. And then after that, a quarterly meeting. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it can be that different. When it comes to a corporate world, they already have their stuff in place. So when they're bringing on a new board member, um, they just have to fit into that, wh- what they've been doing. But, you know, there's always emergency board meetings being called. Right. I mean, I can guarantee you when COVID happened, there was a lot of emergency right. board meetings. Right. Well, and one thing that I was thinking of, too, is in the past and, uh, you know, we were all more localized. Right. So you might have these meetings in person. And now, you know, we've all realized you can be kind of anywhere. So how important is it now to even have people that have to meet in person? Do you plan just maybe one on one meetings instead as well? Or do you plan with everybody, you know, with the board of advisors? Do you all have to meet at the same time? I guess just knowing what the format is that you recommend might be helpful as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think meeting all at the same time is definitely a, in my book, a must. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot more discussions take place. I think prior to the meeting, obviously sending out the agenda is very important. No surprises. Mm -hmm. If there is some crazy surprise or an issue that the CEO might be dealing with, uh, and maybe there's, 
one or two board members that can really help him kind of prior to the meeting, give him some ideas, some, some guidance. I suggest a quick private meeting uh, prior to the board meeting. But that way, everybody's aware of what's on the table and you walk into a meeting with knowing what, what the problem is and what solutions we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, working remotely, I think, kind of, I mean, I hate to say it, that it's a blessing, the whole COVID thing. But right. uh, how about I say it this way? Being forced into working remotely was a blessing, I think, in a lot of ways for us, because from day one, we used to preach, you know, and we heard it all the time. Oh, when somebody in the New York area and it's like, right. oh, I got this awesome guy out here in Colorado that would be the best board member for you. But he's not going to move to New York. But right. This guy would be incredible. His experience and expertise is just over the top. And of course, they wouldn't even look at him because he wasn't in New York. So it really kind of pitch holes us into, OK, so we got instead of looking at 10,000 executives, now we're looking at, you know, 500 executives, which is a lot less fishing for us. Mm -hmm. um, so when COVID happened and people, of course, freaked out and remote work in the beginning was just crazy. People were trying to figure it out. And so were the boards. Uh, but I think once everything kind of like settled down and people are like, hey, this actually is great. I mean. Silicon Valley, how many companies, you know, are not even right. having their employees really go back? They're like, they're being as productive, if not more productive, working from home. Mm -hmm. So for us, that was great because it actually opened up doors and opened right. up people's minds saying, yeah, I don't care where they're at. They can be in England for all I care. I just need, right. I need him available at these times. So as long as he's in this time zone and he makes it work, we're good. So right. yeah, it's been kind of a, a kind of a good thing, really really looking at people's experience, expertise, certification, and overall who they are and uh, putting them in the right spot. Right. And I know earlier you talked about like the compensation that you could have for a board member and it might be equity. It might be a certain amount. So if somebody again has nothing yet set up even, and they want to put together a board and, you know, maybe they say they want to start with like three people or something besides themselves or whatever that number is, but how do they even, realize what might be fair for compensation to even have that discussion with someone. Yeah, no. And that, that question comes up all the time on onboarding calls. It might come up afterwards. Sometimes they don't even think about it till they're, you know, they maybe went through 20 interviews and now they picked okay. out their three, four people and they're like, uh, what do I do next? <laughs> mm -hmm. So no, we do. And in the book, I have some uh, sample contracts uh, that give you kind of a guidance and an idea of course, we're not um, we're not saying this is this is how it should be done, but because we we're asked, we we give you ideas. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I can't mm -hmm. say what's in my book is you know to follow. But again, there's plenty of templates out there, and easily you can get hold of a lawyer and and have one put together for you. Um, and the best thing is, I think, when it comes to equity, vesting it over time, I think is the best. Obviously, you wouldn't want to give up. A, a small portion of your company right off the bat and then never hear right. from the person. So, right. um, you know, it's just like set sweat equity, right? Just at a, mm -hmm. at a small level. So, and it does give them the, the executive motivation to do great things and utilize their network and their experience to help the company. So, right. Right. So obviously you referred to having written a book that has some information on here. So, you know, why don't you tell us just a little bit about the book and what inspired you to even write it? Absolutely. So first of all, this is just a print, but that's what it's going to look like. Um, yeah, so it's called The Corporate uh, Matchmaker and Creating a Robust Boardroom. So it's been, we've talked about this in between the partners for probably two and a half, maybe three years. And it was always like, oh, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great? And nobody had the time. Like, I mean, it, writing a book, oh my gosh, let me tell you, it's brutal. So uh, so a couple of years ago, I, I took it up on myself and I basically told them, I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll start working on it. So put together some of the content. Um, I have a great advisor. Um, who's been in the space longer than us. Uh, he's just at a personal level. He, do, he doesn't do what we do as far as uh, the matchmaking process, but he helps companies uh, and he helps executives basically elevate. So he does some education. 
but he was a great, uh, and he's written a book that's for companies um, more at a technical level, which uh, mm -hmm. it's a book that I've read a couple of times now. And we've become great friends. He actually wrote my forward for this book. But, um, and I talked to him about it and I told him, I said, I'm not writing a technical book. Like his book is great. I mean, it's wonderful. But if you're new to, to the idea, it might be a little bit overwhel overwhelming. Um, so I, I, I took it up on myself to write a little bit lighter, uh, a lot more personal. Um, but it, it was a motivation of, I think it's really needed. I really do think a lot of companies from at any level should always be looking at building or adding to their board. Um, I think diversity is, and I'm not just saying that because the government's pushing for it. Mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been for diversity uh, well, all my life because I look right. at myself as, I, I know I don't look at, I'm a white guy, male, old. But, uh, but I, you know, I, I bring a lot of diversity, um, just being raised where I was raised and grown up right. way differently than most people. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and I've had a lot of challenges in the U.S. I mean, I, I was, a, I, I didn't speak any English when I came to this country. So, um, so yeah, so there was a lot of personal motivation. Uh, my, the first chapter is mainly about me and, and where my drive came from. Um, and I've been told to write an entire book about that long time ago. Like my kids told me and everybody's been telling me, everybody I tell the story to, oh, you should write a book. So this is my version of writing that book. It's just one chapter, but, mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> it's out there now, all my personal stuff. Um, so I've been motivated for quite a while. And about a year ago, after I kind of figured it all out and what I want to write and how I want to write it. I finally found a publisher and, and they basically just got to work on me and, and almost forced me to write it. If I didn't have them, I'd probably still be working on chapter two. <laughs> so they, they are great motivators and, you know, they, they literally put deadlines together for me and, and I had to meet them. So, which so is, is why. It, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, is this book uh, more for, people who are already established and you know they're ready to completely bring somebody on and helping them find that person or people that are going to be on their board or do you recommend it for someone who maybe is starting out as an entrepreneur they're not quite in place yeah. to maybe put that yet but it helps guide them to know when and how like how would who would you recommend the book for I would put a checkbox on everything you just said. So yeah, I would highly recommend it to any uh, executive uh, that's looking to be on the board. Uh, it gives you kind of a, and the reason I say that is it's not specifically written for an executive to learn what it takes to be on a board. It's not a certification course. It's not, but it really gives you a baseline of what is it like to be on a board and what, you know, what kind of a board should I even look for? This is why I say personal mission, vision, values. Uh, and if you're an executive and you're a new executive and maybe one day you imagine yourself being on a board, what should you do? You know, focus on your experience, focus on your expertise. Uh, once you get to a certain level, go get certification that's in governance or, you know, mm -hmm. board um, executive training. There's so much that you can do after college, after executive life. There's so much you can do out there to better yourself and prepare yourself to be a better board member. Um, you know, talks about how many hours should be expected to help to be on a board. So kind of covers all of that for an executive. And at the same time, if you think about it, right, any CEO is going to have a board or maybe should have a board of advisors. So whether you're a CEO reading it to put yourself on a board or whether you're a CEO reading it because you're curious, should I put a board of advisors at least, or maybe add somebody, you know, maybe I'm looking for diversity, kind of, what kind of diversity should I be looking for? So it's written lightly for all those angles for anybody, for companies and for uh, executives. And so even for those who are starting out, you know, like obviously with COVID, it gave a lot of people the opportunity to actually start a business that maybe yeah. thought about it before. So they're just getting started, you know, and maybe they're thinking I'm not even profitable yet. So I can't necessarily even afford something. So like at what point 
do you recommend that they actually start looking for that? Like, do they stay in business or do they need to be in business for a certain period of time? Do you look at revenue? Do you look at number of employees? Like, when is that like a factor that will help you determine when it's you're really ready to have that board member? So I think this book will actually make you discover exactly the question you're asking. And I know I'm saying that because I'm supposed to sell my book, but no, it's, it's true. Um, and, and again, you know, there's part of this book and actually a lot of part of this book is what I would consider motivational. I don't want to say it's a motivational book. Uh, I don't think I'm a motivational speaker, but um, I think there's parts in it that will motivate people and encourage people to do exactly what you're saying, which is grow their business mm-hmm. um, and really make them, I'm hoping make them realize that when that, the sooner they read this book, I think, then the sooner they're going to be able to realize the, the flags or the key points in their business that say, oh, I, I need a board member. Now mm-hmm. it's time I need a board member. So I, I think, I think any, at any point, any executive or any business owner should definitely check out the book. Okay. And I know we're kind of getting short on time now for uh, the podcast that we have. So before we (laughs) go to the close, do you have any additional tips? You know, maybe there's something you wanted to share and I didn't think to ask that question that you want to share with those who are listening. Um, well, stay motivated. Uh, I I hope, I hope we all get through this whole COVID, you know, a lot Mm -hmm. of States right now are mandating again, uh, the masks and who knows what's next. Um, so, you know, hopefully we get through this. Um, and, uh, but other than that, no, um, I know you wanted me to mention possibly finding me. I'm pretty, I'm best to find, I know I said I'm not the greatest social media, but I'm best to find on LinkedIn, uh, pretty easy. Um, Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, last name Rovinsky, R-O-W-I-N-S-K-I. For the book, uh, corporatematchmakerbook.com. If you want to pre-order there, um, once the book comes out, which should be end of the month, it will be available on Amazon and Walmart and Barnes and Noble. So, okay, yeah. Perfect. Well, I know this has been an interesting topic. So thank you so much for being a guest on my show and sharing your expertise. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. It was nice meeting you. You too. And I do want to thank the listeners for tuning in today. I hope you found this topic interesting and that it answered some questions about creating a robust boardroom. If you have any additional questions or comments, be sure to reach out to Martin on LinkedIn, as he said, or you can send us a message at media at abandp.com. And would you please share our show information with those you know? I'd really appreciate your support. I hope you can join us for next week's topic, the sales chain. And please remember, you can connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And my website is abandp.com. And you can find the podcast posted on multiple favorite podcast platforms, including Google, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening to Biz Help For You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next Tuesday. Have a terrific week.